All right. So we are live now. Uh, welcome to the introduction to agent-based models course. I will just make sure I have the right window open here. Yes, I do. Um, this course is like, uh, it's, it's, it's offered by the, the computer science department of the UFLA, Universidade Federal de Lavras. Um, and uh, the course is basically for master's students and bachelor's students. So we're going to have like students from the bachelor's course in computer science here. I don't know if there is anyone from informatics, inform uh, information systems, and uh, the master's program on computer science. We had some students that were from other programs, but um, uh, the thing is, the course is not meant to be just for computer science people. It's meant to be for any any person who wants to understand a little bit more about like uh, the methods of uh, agent-based models. And uh, like programming skills are not required, but we are going to have to learn as we go. And uh, we will learn how to build the models, not just the, the mathematical models, but you're going to learn how to build the simulations and how to analyze the simulations. So um, if you're not like a, too good and in, at programming, just don't be afraid. We are going to go through all the aspects of the, the, the net logo language, that, which is which going to be the one we're going to use. And we are going to go through all the, 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 the knowledge you need to, to, to be able to do your models and to deliver the, the assignments and the, the final project at the end of the course. So my name is Eric. Uh, I know some of you. I think Italo had like a, some, had a lesson with you, had uh, attended a course with me before. Hof, Hof is my uh, my student, so, but I, I don't think I know any of the other students. I know that Myron sent some students to this class. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, I'm professor at UFLA. Um, you can call me by the name. It's fine. I don't. I don't mind. Um, I'm currently the header of the the Bilbo Lab, like the Behavioral Informatics Laboratory. So I work mainly with data science and agent-based models. And we're gonna see throughout the course how how these two go together. And currently, I'm a guest researcher also at the the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. Uh, so it's the the university I did my PhD, I'm, stu I'm still working with them and some projects there. Let me just see if I didn't miss anything here. Yeah, so, all right. Um, so, uh, to start talking about agent-based models, there are many different ways. Mostly when you go on the internet and you search for like uh, what's agent-based models, uh, you're going to end up like uh, seeing kind of the same example. So I will do as many instructors do. I will begin the course with like a, one first example just to, to introduce the concepts and uh, the ideas uh, from our pure observation of nature phenomena. And um, well, I, I, I just want to say here that like I, I own a lot for a lot of people who provide materials on the internet. So my material is not like uh, all my own. Like I didn't do everything. I, I, I copied a lot of stuff and of course I adapted to the, the, the program we are doing. So I just wanna say that it, some of the examples and some of the, the ideas shared here, they are not my own, but they are part of other people's materials. So, uh, and another thing it's important to say is that this is the first time we are having this course so mistakes will be made <laughs> and uh, we, we're going to need some improvements for the future. So you are very welcome. And uh, I would really appreciate uh, if you could interact and give me some feedback over the content, over the materials used, over the, the language used. And uh, so, so I can uh, improve it and the uh, next semester you can have a better, better course. So we are going to start with the, this initial exploration with the, the murmuring of the starlings. So just so you know, like uh, the, the, the starlings are 
some type of birds. And uh, you can see, we're gonna just watch here for a little bit, uh, this uh, amazing pattern that's created by the, the birds. So you can see that you have like a bunch of birds, maybe thousands of birds there, and they are basically flocking and flying and creating random patterns, but at the same time, keeping uh, some, uh, some characteristics. Uh, these birds, as I said, like they're called starlings, and uh, it's possible to see, for instance, that they fly quite close together, and uh, the movement resembles some sort of dance or some sort of uh, uh, art piece. It's quite nice, it's a, it's a very beautiful pattern. But the important point here is, uh, and the, the, the main point we wanna show here in this, uh, in this part of the course, is how the patterns emerge and how these birds, they, they make decisions as how they fly. So you can see that the pattern is, is, is irregular, but at the same time, it's kind of synced. So you can see that the birds, they, they don't just like uh, fly by themselves. They, they have some group characteristics. They have some group combination of movements that like uh, makes the, the group movement uh, random, but at the same time, keep them together and keep them going in the same direction and uh, keep them like making like a cloud of birds. So agent-based models, they are like a very suitable tool to study and replicate this, exactly this kind of observation. And uh, we can see that with birds, we can see that sometimes with humans, we can see that with like uh, companies and governments you're gonna see in the future. But in particular, like we are very interested in knowing how the individual behaviors, like in this case, like the individual behaviors of the birds, they affect the whole group and vice versa. So we can tell that the group affects the individual decisions of the birds, but the, the individual decisions of the birds also affect the group. So to see how this is done, we will have our first contact with the net logo interface and uh, show how this uh, specific scenario kind of unfolds on our simulator. And I would just, just like, uh, so, um, yep. So there is a, like the, the, there are some, some studies from decades ago about exactly this phenomenon. So some scientists, they've been observing these birds, these, these starlings uh, over time. And they've tried to come up with like some explanation for why they fly like that. Um, on that logo, we can uh, basically, and th this is gonna happen a few times during the lecture, I'm gonna have to, to, to change between the, the presentation and the uh, net logo interface, so just bear with me. And, uh, this is not the, the model I wanna show, this is the one. And uh, here, like, uh, don't be afraid by now, because this is, this is the tool we're gonna use, but I don't want you to worry about the, the tool now. I just want you to show that like, uh, it is possible if you know how the, the rules dictate how the birds make the, their decisions, it is possible to create some simulations. And in this case here, you can see that each triangle would, would, would be a bird and the colors, don't, they don't matter here at all. And when you create the, the movement in the simulation, you can observe that like over time, I'm gonna just accelerate here a little bit. The birds that were initially just flying by random, they, they, they start to show some, uh, some similar behavior as we saw from the, the previous video. And that's quite nice because um, it means basically that we can uh, construct like a, in a computational model, some patterns we observe in nature and uh, that will give us like a very powerful way of understanding some phenomena and a very powerful way also to solve some problems that uh, just by using statistics or other uh, fields of study, uh, we weren't able to, to understand or to simulate or to, to analyze. So basically that's what happens here. So uh, what, I wanted, what, what I wanna do now 
is just um, ask you to, to think a little bit about the video we watched and the simulation and try to come up with some potential ideas of like uh, why uh, do the birds fly like they do. So if you want to write on the, on the board of questions, you can do it there. If you want to just like a talk, you can talk. Let's just take a few moments for you to, to, to think and to come up with some ideas. So we can start like uh, thinking like uh, modelers. I can wait, guys. I'm I'm free until like five p.m. <laughs> I have no idea. Like I, I will give you like uh, the first like uh, the first clue. So like uh, the birds, they basically don't hit each other. Like they don't have shocks like uh, between them, right? So th there should be a rule that avoid like this kind of thing to to happen at least, right? So Pedro is, Pedro is here saying that I think the birds try to fly without bumping each other. That that's that's a very good starting point, Pedro, because if like uh, in the video we saw, like uh, you don't see the birds just like uh, falling because they are hitting each other. They they don't bump. Um, and for that reason, there there should be a rule that like if the birds gonna bump on another bird, like uh, they should basically divert. They should like uh, change their movement, right? So that that's one uh, one 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 kind of rule. So, uh, what wh what else can we can we think from this? Like they they have to find flying groups, right? So. Yeah, so there is a uh, saying that there is a kind of randomness. One bird change direction and that affects the entire group. That's very good. It's very good because that's exactly what we see. Like, uh, like uh, in one moment in the video, the birds are going out to the left and then suddenly they're going out to the right. Like uh, that happens exactly because uh, when one bird changes direction, it, it affects the other birds and uh, they, they basically follow him. Italy saying that they attempt to man maintain the, the same speed into the group. That that's very good. Uh, that's that's very good uh, insight as well, and very important to notice because uh, if one bird flies faster than the other bird, then you kind of uh, you, you split the group. You're not going to have the cluster. Like uh. nice guys, very nice. So um, going back to the presentation here, I'm gonna. Um, Just one comment, uh, Professor. Uh, probably they have some kind of leader also, right? Because when they know how to turn, when they know how to come back, uh, or how they split themselves. So yeah, probably that... they have some kind of uh, direction or some leader or someone that they will follow. Yeah, that, that's a very good question because, like, a, is there a leader? Like, uh, you, you see, like, when ducks, they fly, you, you obviously see the leader because the, the, the pattern of the flight of the, 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 the ducks is basically like in V. And uh, they, from time to time, they even change the leader just so they can keep the pace. Uh, but in this case here, like, you have so many birds, it, it's quite difficult to, 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 to see, like, uh, any bird who is leading the, the, the band. Like, uh, yeah, like Pedro thinks that there is not a leader. But that, that's the kind of discussion, like that's very important discussion. Because when you observe some phenomena on the, on the, in, in, like in nature, uh, those are the, the kind of questions that should come up to our, head, to our heads. So we can start like uh, 
understanding how the thing works. So later we, we are able to, to replicate that, that like a real situation on a, on a computational simulation. Um, I will give you the, the, the answer, of course. Like, so the, there are like basically three rules that, that guide these birds. Um, and they are very basic rules. Like, uh, and they, they define the movement of the birds, uh, the, the fact that all the birds act on the same way or within the same rules. So um, I'm just gonna share with you here. I don't want, I don't want to keep you too curious about it. So each bird uh, in this situation here makes its decision uh, consider, considering the, the neighborhood uh, that is like their, their flock mates. Uh, there is no central leader, so that's uh, just to, to inform like that, to make you more aware of uh, what's happening. But each bird uh, follows the same rules. So you have like a bunch of birds, they all follow the same three simple rules. And the thing is, the, the pattern just emerge, emerge. Like it, it, it's, it's uh, one of the most interesting things in nature. So you have like three rules. The first rule is the aligning rule. And uh, by aligning rule, we were saying that uh, the birds individually, they try to align themselves with the, the heading of the other birds. So the heading here is basically the, the, the direction the other birds are going. So of course, like uh, one bird cannot read the whole group because they're like some birds are closer, some are very far away from them. But they basically have like a radius of birds where they, they look at them. They check like uh, the direction they're taking and the bird, the, all the birds try to align themselves to that heading that they are taking. So that's the first rule. The second rule is uh, the cohere rule. So uh, cohere here, we're talking about coherence. So it's about how the birds, they, they keep themselves together. So once you've aligned with the heading of the birds around you, you move towards the center of your closed flock mates group. So there is also the, the this like a, they all try to, to be like a, going to the center of their groups. So they're all clustered together. And the last rule is the separate rule, which is the first one that Pedro uh, noticed and uh, commented uh, at the beginning. So if you're gonna crash, <laughs> if you're gonna bump on the other bird, you, you have to move away. And uh, the separate rule basically over overrides all the other two rules. So like, it doesn't matter if you're going to the center or if you're aligning yourself to the heading of the, your flock mates. If you're gonna bump in another bird, you just change your route. And uh, this is like, uh, I think the, 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 the most interesting rule because that's possibly the rule that creates the randomness and the, the movement of the birds. Because like if they all start like going to the same direction and align themselves, they would just fly like in a line after a while. And exactly because they don't wanna bump in each other, they kind of sometimes diverge. And one bird to not bump in another bird, it, the, birds, the bird diverts. And then of course the other birds are gonna follow him. And then you have like a collective behavior that creates the patterns. So it's uh, it, it's very interesting how like a very simple rules, very simple rules can affect the whole group and create this kind of behavior. And this is, kind, this is the kind of stuff that you're gonna study here a lot. Like I'm giving you a very simple and initial example about birds, but we are gonna see a lot of stuff like uh, with society, uh, in biology, in nature, in chemistry, in computer science, in many fields that kind of have the same uh, way of like uh, showing like the patterns of stuff. And then you're gonna see how we can uh, observe, model, simulate and analyze this kind of stuff. So that's basically what this course is about. So what's the, the course structure in here? Uh, we are gonna divide the course in nine units, but I just put seven in here, which are gonna be the main things we're gonna go through. Um, so the, the, the first uh, topic is basically what we're doing here. It's like a what's agent-based modeling and why, why should we use it? Like why, why is it important, so important that we make a course just for it? Uh, then like the next week, we are gonna start with a simple model. We are gonna see how a simple model works on that logo using like uh, the, the, the tool and checking how the, what's the structure of the, the tool we're gonna use and like just basically understanding how the first model 
is uh, created. Then on the third week, you're going to start expanding this simple model. So you're going to start with a very simple model, and then you're going to start like creating other stuff and adding them to the model we, we've started uh, before. Uh, on the fourth week, you're going to then create a full agent-based model. So we are going to uh, just notice that this course is very practical. So we are going to learn by doing stuff. Today, like, uh, we might have the most theoretical class, but from this week on, like, from next week on, we, we are going to be very practical. So we're going to see how things work, and we're going to learn from them, and then we're going to do things ourselves. So we can build up our knowledge and do things, like, uh, as we go. Uh, so on the fourth week, we're going to be able to create our, a full agent-based model. So we're going to create from, from scratch. And on the fifth uh, week, we're going to start like studying the structure of the, the agent-based models. And then you're going to be more like a theoretical and more like a deep on uh, how we perceive and how we do this agent-based model. So you can have also a, a very strong basis for when you start doing your own models. And then we, after that, we are going to understand how we do analysis, verification, validation, and replica replication of these models. Uh, and that's very important because, like, uh, you need to be able to read other people's models. You need to be able to criticize other people's models, and you need to be able to reuse other people's models, adapt to them, and uh, use them on your own context. So, uh, the 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 sixth topic there is going to give you this freedom to kind of uh, be more fluent on agent-based models and to interact with other people's models. So you don't have to always start from zero. And the uh, last, uh, last part of the course is we're just going to give you a brief introduction to advanced agent-based models. So I just want to give you a glimpse of what else you can do. So the idea of the course is just to introduce you to the topic, give you some uh, um, basic knowledge on programming, uh, teach you how to create some initial models, to build them, to simulate. And by the end of the course, I'm going to give you like a, a path to, to, so you can expand your knowledge. So we're going to talk about GIS. We're going to uh, give you a glimpse of like you can use GIS information. You can use geographical information on your models. So you can like simulate societies moving on a city, for instance. Or you can use uh, Python or R or other languages connected with NetLogo to, to create like a data science and agent-based models together. Or you can use... Uh, time uh, libraries that are not like uh, native from the, the net logo. So I'm going to just give you an idea of what else you can do from what you've learned already. Um, about the assignments, we, we are going to have, of course, we have to grade you, um, but uh, we, we won't have any, any exams, basically. The course is mainly practical and uh, uh, we are still like uh, in the middle of a pandemic, so we, we we are following the guidelines of the university regarding the 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 fact that the assignments will be weekly. You're gonna receive like a, a PDF full of instructions for you to study by yourselves, to spend some time doing uh, your your own homework, and then uh, you will uh, submit the results of your homework. Uh, just beware of the deadlines. The deadlines are very important and the uh, I, I, it's not just about the grade, it's about uh, the fact that the course is planned. So like uh, the next lecture is going to need that you finish your homework before so you can uh, take more advantage of it. So like uh, you're going to see that the deadlines are usually on Monday. So you have until Monday uh, to, to submit your assignments and the lectures are usually on Tuesdays. So I plan ahead. And uh, don't don't be surprised if some of the assignments, some of the homeworks, they push you a little bit like uh, further away. Like sometimes you're gonna have to do stuff that I didn't teach you yet, and that's okay. It's basically a way to to put you ahead of the lecture. So when you come to the lecture, we have a nice interaction. And it's not about the grade. It's not about grading. It's about learning. I'm more interested in your learning here than about your grade. Um, so we have weekly homeworks. These weekly homeworks, they will end when we start the final project. So you're going to have a final project. Project. So I even recommend you to start thinking about it now. So as we go in the course, 
you you go we're gonna see many examples today check the examples like uh, look at them and see like uh, oh this is interesting i could study this phenomena for instance like i, I could like uh, take a look at this i could take a look at that and uh, make sure that you um you start building the ideas in your head at least so you can start building a model as soon as possible and by the end of the semester we are going to have the seminars which is basically you presenting uh, the models you've built okay um nothing too complex like nothing that requires like uh, you to make like a, a ted talk uh but i i just want you to to have the chance to share what you've built what you've found out from your, your models and uh, i i really hope you have fun this is a course that like uh if you if you really start learning and you get the grip like of the course you are going to have a lot of fun because these models they are very fun to to work with um about communication like uh, you you have access uh to my email address you, you can send me emails anytime you want um there is the the forum and the campus so uh, the announcements board like you can you can you can interact with it as well you can make questions uh i would recommend you to use the forums because then other students can maybe some the same the other students have the same question as you have and if you just send to me like uh, i receive like three or four emails with the same question and i have to reply one by one uh so it's better if you could share like with everyone your 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 uh, questions and your doubts so we can um, we can interact better in the the, camp, the campus virtual which is the the main uh, tool we're going to use throughout the course we're going to have weekly live meetings as this one uh, i can provide you with private meetings as well so you can request by email uh, to talk with me like uh, when you start building your project maybe you want to discuss your project in person uh, just send an email explaining what's the topic of the conversation. Make clear that on your email you you provide some initial info in advance, uh, so I can also plan myself to to help you better. And uh, with your free time as well, so I can uh, I can fit your schedule uh, into my schedule here. All right. Which software we're gonna be using? Well, we're gonna be using NetLogo. And Python, it's a maybe, okay? It's a maybe because it depends on your project. Uh, it depends on um, what you're gonna do. And if you are like, uh, if you feel like, oh, I like doing data science with Java, or I like doing data science with R or another language, you're also free to use any language you want. I just uh, chose Python because I like Python and I, I program better in Python so I can give you better support but you're free to use any language the only obligatory language you're gonna have to learn and use is it's net logo which is basically the language you're gonna be using to, to build the models um, about the literature um, we, we we have basically three books that will guide us I'm going to use mainly the first one. The first book is like a tutorial and it's accessible on the link. You can have it on the course plan as well, on the, the syllabus of the course. And um, uh, it, it's free, like a, it's a PDF available on the link. So you can just download it and, uh, and use it. It's a book by Jennifer Badham. Uh, she's a very, very good uh, agent-based based modeling uh, researcher. And uh, her book is like, it's, it's really good. So I, I recommend. Uh, the Yuri Wilinski uh, book is, a, it's like a, the Bible book for most of the courses. And uh, agent-based uh, and individual-based modeling book by Raysback is also very good. But these two, they are more difficult to find. And uh, the library of our universities are acquiring them now. So I ask them to buy the books. As soon as the books are in the library, we're gonna we're gonna tell you so you can uh, can have access. Though we are in the midst of a pandemic, so you can't go to the library anyways. So it doesn't make much difference now. All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what is an agent-based model. So I, I started with the example of the birds, 
Uh, and the example of the birds is very good for you to start like uh, thinking as modelers. But w w what is indeed like an agent-based model? So let's let's start thinking about what's a model, right? And uh, a model can be many things, many things. Like uh, uh, you have like uh, the the models who are like uh, people who dress certain clothes made by some specific uh, designers and uh, they are called models because they are there to show you how the clothes would look like if you buy them and if you wear them though these models they are never like uh, they don't they don't have the same body shape as normal people so it's a uh, uh, and this example is good because it, it starts like uh, with the discussion about like uh, are models like perfect no they are not and they are not because they are not meant to be perfect we're going to talk a little bit about that later but uh, that's one example. Like on the the top right on your screen, you're gonna see like uh, this uh, this beetle. It's a it's a model as well, and some people like even collect this kind of stuff. So it, it's not a real car, but if you look at it, you say like, oh, it, it's a car. It's a beetle. Uh, it's a little beetle. So you, you can by looking at this uh, the at the figure, you, you you can identify what's the model man means to represent. So, but, but it's not a car, it doesn't have an engine, you can't drive it, you can't even fit inside it. So, uh, but it's, it's just a model, it's a prototype, let's say. Uh, and uh, on the bottom right, you, can, you have like some equations. So that's uh, uh, the, the equation for energy. Um, and this equation basically, it, it, it is a model also. And uh, it is a model, it's a mathematical model meant to um, explain or to, to describe how certain things work in nature. So um, we have plenty of these equations and you, you've possibly uh, been in, in contact with loads of them. The gravity equation, it, it's meant to model the gravity. Uh, it's just a formula, but it's a, just a formula, but like uh, uh, when you use it correctly, it basically gives you an idea of like uh, uh, what would happen if you jump from a building, like uh, uh, if, if the impact is enough to kill you or not. So if you if you need to jump from somewhere, you you can like uh, the thing is we don't make the 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 the, the numbers. We don't like uh, write the equation on our heads and make the numbers. But we have an idea, and this idea of the gravity kind of basically gives uh, birth to the equations, and the equations are meant also to model the reality. And uh, in this case, the model is perfect. Like on the the equation of the gravity, I don't think there is any. There is any proof that uh, the equation is missing something. Uh, so uh, people start like it's it's very important to 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 understand also that models they're very old. Like uh, we 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 are not like creating models because we created computers. Like models they exist even before computer science, even before informatics, even before a lot of stuff. Our numerical system is a model. Like uh, when you see the number one. Like a, it's a figure, it's a, it's a draw. You draw something, it's a symbol, and you know that symbol means that that's a quantity of one. But someone had to create it before. So like uh, we, we have, and, and numbers exist like uh, for thousands of years. So we, we have like these things for a long, long time. Uh, Starfield basically then defines the models as like a, a, gen a general characteristic all models share is that a model is a purposeful and simplified representation of aspects of reality. So models usually are meant to represent something you see, something you observe. Um, models usually are not used to simulate something that doesn't exist. That's what basically Starfield is going to say. And uh, George Box. Uh, and and statistician uh, from like uh, decades ago also, and in eighty seven he he wrote this uh, this paper on an empirical model building and response surfaces, and uh, his quote is famous nowadays and everyone uses his quotes but it, it's very important to always remember that that all models are wrong, but some are useful, and he's saying because he he's saying that because like uh, we use models to simulate reality but 
to simulate reality with all the complexity that there is in reality and with all the aspects we need to include in the models, it's a rather like a tough task. It's very difficult. It's not simple. It requires a lot of effort. And uh, when it's not just effort, you need a lot of resources like computational power, uh, memory and stuff that sometimes you just don't have. So um, it's important always to keep that in mind because uh, one of the, the, the criticism that agent-based mo agent models uh, receive from time to time is that like, oh, but this is not perfect, perfect. And we always reply, of course, it's not meant to be perfect. It's just meant to give us an idea about how would these birds fly if we put certain rules at them. That's basically how it goes. So why bother modeling them? Like, why do we bother like even uh, modeling if the models are not perfect? Well, for, first of all, um, models, they help us a lot to understand how things work. So even not being perfect, like it's like the flight simulator. Like if you have a flight simulator, is, is it perfect? Like does it replicate exactly the, the, the weather conditions and the pressure conditions of that specific point in space? It doesn't, it doesn't. But like it, it provides you with all the basic tools you need to simulate in a, let's say, in a, in a minimal uh, way uh, how, how, how the, the, the airplane works and what you need to do to, to, put, to take off the, with the airplane and to land. So you need, it's very important to understand things. It's also very useful, useful to explain observed patterns. That's what, that's what basically what we just did with the birds. But we can use it for like a criminality. Why people commit crimes? We can start using models for building that and trying to explain like uh, why uh, this specific region of the city is so violent and this, uh, others, this, this other region of the city is not. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you can't just like uh, build uh, an empirical uh, experiment. You can't, you can't just like build a, a city in real life and make some people poor and make some people rich just to see what happens. So you just simulate these things and see uh, what the simulation tells us. And also to predict how chains would affect the, the proposed model. So I'm going to talk a lot with you, a lot about um, uh, some, some models built to uh, simulate disaster situations, for instance. So like disaster situations are the, 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 the perfect sen uh, scenario where we, we, we can't just make a test. Like I can't put a fire in a building just to see how people evacuate the building. I can't just like a sink a ship to see if like if people are gonna uh, get out of the ship like on time. It's 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 insane to think about this thing. So we do simulations. We create simulations. We create a, a, an artificial boat on the computer. We put our artificial people in there, and we then sink the ship in the computer to see what happens if people go this way, if people go that way, if we put a stair lad in here, if you put like uh, some uh, boats in here, some boats in there, and, and so on and so forth. So that's basically why we do simulations and modeling and stuff. But like uh, specifically, what is an agent-based model? Like uh, we've seen many models, but what's an agent-based model? So an agent-based model is a model that's based on agents. It's very stupid, but that, that's what it is. But what is an agent? A, an agent, here's a, it's, uh, we're going to define it, it as an uh, autonomous individual element. And uh, this individual element, he has some characteristics, which we call like properties. And uh, these individual elements, they also have some procedures, some actions, and they are in a computational simulation, they're, they're in a computer simulation. So agents here can be anything anything it can be people like uh, you you have like a uh, some uh, um, you we want to simulate disneyland the agents can be people just on the lines waiting for the their their their, their, their goal to go on on the right um we can um uh build like a a simulation of nature we can we can we can try to uh, understand uh, how animals interact with each other and if they're going to multiply or not according to the, their environment. So the agents can be wolves, they can be sheep, 
they can be cats, they can be dogs. The, the agents can be cells. You can try to be, you can, you can uh, be, you can study, for instance, like uh, uh, body parts uh, and uh, the the interactions between cells. So you can try to simulate the vi the, the vaccine uh, effect on your body when it enters your body, and then the agents can be the 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 the, the dead viruses that they put on your body to to interact with the the your immune system, for instance. So it can be anything. It can be the streets, it can be the government, and uh, yeah, the, the, the office uh, fire simulation is the best thing. Uh, Dwight just putting fire by on purpose just to see what people do. It, it's just like, it, that's the perfect perfect example of like a, how we shouldn't do that in real life. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that, that's an amazing example. Thanks for that. Um, um, but th th that's the main thing, like agents, they are basically autonomous. So that means that they, they make decisions by themselves. And, uh, and they have like properties. So like uh, you can have like different agents in your simulation doing like uh, stuff in a different way, but with the same rules, basically. That's, uh, that's what makes it interesting. And then agent-based modeling, we are going to be like the approach that we take based on this idea that the world can be modeled using agents, an environment, and a description of interactions. So uh, one of the main things here is that like uh, on agent-based modeling, the agents, they can interact with themselves, but they can also interact with the environment. So you can build on your simulation, like uh, the context. Uh, if, if it's people in a city, you can build the city. You can uh, uh, define like a, What's the if uh, if the term like if some specific street is like a uh, dark or uh, more light? If the, the 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 road is larger or narrower? If the road has a lot of people or not? If the road has shops or if the the road is like just houses? You can define all this kind of stuff, and people can interact with the environment uh, based on what you've built. So you create the rules; they're going to interact. So we derive the results from individual simple rules that will define how the interactions happen. And uh, that's interesting because this is the best way that we, can, that we have to describe a lot of complex systems around us. We're going to talk about complex systems in a bit, but like, that's how we basically uh, model like, complex systems. And as I said, like, the agents can be anything. You can be building a model about like uh, the governments. So, like you can be building a model about uh, the chance of having a World War III based on uh, the nation's relationships. And you can build a model like that and you can create the variables and you can assume like uh, some, uh, uh, you can make some assumptions like uh, uh, if uh, this specific country is uh, rich enough and powerful enough and uh, isolated enough, like uh, it's going to trigger uh, some, uh, some frictions with other countries. And if the, the, the simulation, if the, the emergent uh, behavior of that, all the nations reach certain point, then you have a war. You can do that. Or, or you can talk, we can talk about companies. So we can simulate, for instance, if like some company is going to take over the market on top of, other, of, the, of, of the others, if they, they launch, let's say, a new product that like everyone is gonna buy and it's gonna make all the other uh, products from the other companies like obsolete. So um, you can you can uh, make individual cells, animals. You're gonna see some examples here. But agents can be anything basically. And uh, the 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 main things on agent-based models that we create rules, simple rules for the agents. These rules define how the agents interact with themselves and with the environment, and then we see what happens. Usually, that's how it goes. It's not much different from that. Um, why net logo? Why, why, why are we using net logo? Well, basically, we, we, we have loads, like dozens of other tools we could, we could, we could use for, for agent-based modeling, including Python. Python has uh, like, like libraries and uh, uh, a lot of tools that would, would help us to, to, to do the all the models you're going to build on that logo, we could build in another simulation. But I've picked that logo because uh, the language is made uh, for non-programmers. Like it's made for non-computer science people, and the learn curve is fast. 
uh, and that helps a lot because the, the intent of this course is even to attract like people from other departments. It's not just for computer science. I want to see people from social sciences, from uh, ecology, from uh, engineering, uh, and other many fields that are like also interested in applying this kind of method on their fields. And uh, there is a lot of applications on, from this this. Uh, uh, from what of, we're going to learn in here, but I uh, I chose NetLogo because of that. Because like uh, if you start with Python, you have to learn the language first. While NetLogo, you learn the language and you learn agent-based model at the same time. Because the the language was created exclusively for modeling complex systems, so it's a language only for agent-based models. It, it, you can do other stuff with it, but like a mainly like a, the language is meant to be used for agent-based models. Uh, NetLog also is a very powerful because it allows uh, thousands of agents acting simultaneously. So you, that's a very important thing. You can build like very big simulations on NetLog. It doesn't have to be restrained to like a, just a few elements. You can put like thousands and it works. It's simple. The models, they are easy to share. And the models are also easy to analyze and to be questioned by other people. So all these things combined make NetLogo a very suitable, suitable tool for, for our course. So I want to check with you a few models and uh, just like have, have some fun here looking at some of them. And uh, before that, I just want to refresh on your heads some of the characteristics of agent-based models. So what we're doing here is basically taking real world, reading the world, seeing how things interact, how the environment affects people, how people affect the environment, and bringing it to an agent-based model, creating a simulation. What can we do here? Like, uh, what, what are the main characteristics of this kind of stuff that we, we have to take into account? The agents are different from each other. So we have some uh, heterogeneity here, right? So you have, uh, may, like if you're, if you're simulating humans, you have male, female, you have like uh, older people, younger people, you have uh, uh, less educated people, more educated people. You have like a lot of ways that we can uh, uh, define the characteristics of people and uh, that affects how people behave. So for instance, uh, there are some uh, uh, research, there is some research on like uh, how people flee from uh, a disaster situation. So like uh, you're like in a metro station uh, underground and uh, there is a terrorist attack. Like uh, usually people from West, like, uh, like us, <laughs> we usually react more like we, we try to flee before we try to gather our beloved people. While like uh, people from Japan and from like uh, the, the the east, they um, tend to gather their families first to then flee. So that's some cultural things, some cultural differences that you just observe by seeing people behave, and from that you can create the models. Uh, Ana Paula, do you have a question? You can. You can. Uh... Yeah, uh, I I have a question. Uh... I, I think it's very similar to the theory of graphs. Uh, there is a, a, a something in common between them. You, like graphs, like social networks and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. We, yeah, there, there, there is a lot to do because, uh, because um, when you build your model and people interact with each other, uh, you can create some ties between them. Most of my work is on social networks. So we're going to see a lot of examples about how social networks affect people and how we can construct uh, agent-based models on social networks. Those are like three topics that always walk together. It's uh, agent-based agent models, complex systems, and social network, social networks. We are, go we are going to see that. And just FYI, uh, um, when I say social networks, I'm not talking about Facebook, OK? I'm talking about like uh, the structure uh, of graphs where like you have nodes and the uh, edges and they kind of define the topology and how the, the nodes interact among themselves. 
But uh, yeah, uh, well, well noted, uh, Anna. Other characteristic is like interdependence between different fields within a model. So like when you build this kind of like, like when you build a model that um, contains many different aspects, uh, you're gonna, uh, the agent-based models let you basically include all the aspects of the model. So you can have like, um, if you're working like with violence, uh, you're gonna have some elements that are like geographical elements. So the, the robber needs to be in certain location to commit the crime. So that's like a GIS. So we have like a, to, to have a, a spatial uh, layer on our model where we know that certain, some, some areas are more dangerous than other areas and some areas are more suitable for the, the, the robber than other areas. At the same time, we can have social aspects in the model, which are basically like the background of the robber. Like, uh, why is him like uh, committing the crime? Does he need the money? Is him like a drug addict and he, he, he desperately needs the money? Or he just does that for fun? Like some people just like to do bad stuff because they have fun doing that. So you can, you can have psychological, psychological aspects as well. You can have biological aspects as well. And uh, this, all these layers, they can come together in the model to make it work and they work together and they give us like a, a very suitable uh, simulation so we can read and understand. And that's very interesting because mostly people just study one layer at a time and people get very specialized like the biologist is going to study just the biological aspects of uh, some disease while the, the psychologist can, uh, can uh, bring other like a uh, view on the topic and he can say like, no, the, the emotional aspects can contribute to certain disease that the biologist mostly want like a uh, study because it's not part of his field. So when you, we do agent-based models, we kind of try to bring everything together. And uh, that's why we need specialists when we are working with this kind of stuff. Another thing important to note is that like uh, we mostly study uh, things that doesn't have an equi equilibrium. So mostly the models we build, they go out of balance. We're gonna see some, some examples in here, but the dynamics of the models, they are usually chaotic. We're gonna define chaos and, and maybe next week, but it's mostly chaotic. And we can also uh, include on our model like macro and micro levels. We can also do that because of the layers and the local interactions and relevance of the physical space is also taken into account when you're building the models. So who is using this, uh, this tool? Let's see some examples here. So we have books on uh, individual based modeling which is another name for agent based modeling and ecology, we have it. We have agent-based modeling in economics. We have a lot of studies on economics. Uh, we have agent-based model on party competition. So like on politics uh, to understand uh, how parties, politician, par polit political parties, they, they win like uh, on the decisions in the chambers uh, in the government and uh, how they are connected or even how the corruption is spread uh, among the parties. So we have all these studies like uh, combined using agent-based models as well. Uh, we have simulation for the social scientists. So we have social science um, agent-based modeling. It's also uh, a field of study. We have agent-based modeling of tax evasion, like uh, uh, to understand how companies, they avoid paying the taxes and how the companies, they uh, make profit on top of the government and how these things they scale up. So we have agent models for that. We have agent-based modeling combined with geographical information information systems. So we can use like a maps, like a GIS maps uh, combined with uh, agent-based models, for instance, to study like when a dam breaks, uh, what's the extent of the disaster, for instance, or like if you have an area uh, around the stadium I mean, and you have a huge crowd going to a concert, if people have to evacuate, how, how would they behave? And how, if the environment is like open enough so people can evacuate, evacuate quick. Uh, we have agent-based modeling for criminological theory testing and development, so we can understand crimes. And uh, this pink book, I'm, a, I'm one of the, 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 the writers of this book, there's a chapter by me in there. 
Uh, so we, we are going to see this chapter during the course as well to understand how we use this in criminology. And uh, the right one you can't read because I can't read as well. But it's a very, it's a brand new book. I got the email last week and it's agent-based modeling and archaeology. So people are like uh, building back old societies, old civilizations using agent-based models to understand like how the Babylonian, Babylonians, for instance, how did they do the logistics of the, their army in war? So they, they read the materials from the archaeologists and they try to reconstruct the civilizations on a computational simulation to understand how things work. Very, very interesting. A lot of fun. I'm very looking forward to read this book as well. But let's see some, um, some examples here. Uh, and uh, talking about Dwight and fire, we are going to see um, Dwight Troop uh, model on a uh, forced fire here. And I want to um, uh, start by showing you another um, net logo simulation model. Let me just open here. Let's go back to our fellow net logo. You're going to interact with, with it a lot the following in the following months. Um, interesting. The fire model. So let's open here. Fire. Fire. Um, yep. So this is a, this is a very, very interesting model. Um, basically, what happens in here is that like we, we have a square that represents some force and uh, the density here defines uh, the percentage of this area that's taken by tree. So every green spot you have on the map represents a tree, okay? And uh, you, can you can see that there is a red line on the left and the red line basically is where the fire starts and uh, the model basically says, the, like, the, the thing is, if there is uh, a green, uh, there is a plant on fire besides you, you're going to get on fire as well. That's how it basically works. It's a very simple model. Uh, each tree is an agent. And the tree basically is not burned if there are no other trees around that tree that are burning as well. Okay? And... Um, the density here basically defines the, the first scenario. You can see that it's random. So, so every time I, I hit set, set up here, we, we have a different uh, forest, let's say. And if I click go here, then the fire starts spreading and it spreads and it spreads over time. So the thing is like you have like, a, we, we count the time as ticks. We are gonna learn that. But every time step here is like, a, let's say if, my, if I'm a tree and uh, on time step X, time step X, uh, one tree besides me is on fire on time step X plus one, I will be on fire as well. And that's how it goes. So that's why it spreads um, uh, like along the, the, the forest. As you can see here, like we have at the end of the simulation, 12.4% of the forest burned. Okay, if I hit set up and go again, we are going to have another simulation. So you can see that the, the fire is spreading, 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 but uh, it, it's not like going too far. It's, it's kind of a, like a stopping spreading after a while. Like a, here it's like 18%, 18, 18 and if you go again here, you can, uh, you can see that it's going to go around like a, 18%, like this one's going further. So this is like, a, wow, it's like 25%. So just notice that we are using here this same density, okay? And the question in here is like, what happens? And in which point we're gonna have a situation where like I put the fire at the beginning of the forest and it spreads all the way to the other side of the forest. So we can, if we increase here, like for instance, let's say 61% here, what happens? Uh, we're gonna see that like the fire now is spreading more because we, we basically increased the, the, the density of the forest. 
So the fire is going more and more and more and more, and now it's reaching the other side. All right. So now, like we had, we had almost like a, it's like seventy six percent of the forest is burned. But if I go here on a, let's say sixty percent, does it happen again? So you can see that with sixty percent, the fire spreads, but like a, not as much as with with like sixty one percent. But it's uh, it's reaching the other side. Like in this case here, it reached the other side. What if you go? Let, let, let it finish. What if we go 59%? Then we hit go. It's gonna, let me, it's gonna spread, 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 but it doesn't reach. So observe that like a, from 59% to 60%, the difference on the area burned is ridiculous. Like a, here we burned like 25%. If I put it on 60%, 61%, it burned 70% of the forest. So it's just a 2% difference that makes a huge difference on the disaster caused by the fire. This kind of stuff, guys, is called the tipping point. Okay, so we have the tipping point of the simulation. So we found, during the simulation, we found one specific point that if we go like a, more than that point, we, we basically burn the whole forest. And if you go a little bit before that point, we kind of uh, don't have such, such such a damage caused by the fire. But note, notice that um, this simulation, for instance, is it perfect? It's not. I'm not considering if it's rainy or not. I'm not considering if the trees are tall, if the trees are like a shorter, if they're greener or not, which, which season of the year you're talking about. But the fact is, the simulation basically shows us that the density of the forest matters when we're spreading fire in it. So that can be used for many purposes. And uh, we even found like in the simulation, uh, the, the tipping point, which is kind of a, which super cool in my opinion. Um, the next model I want to show you is the, the, the model about the wolves and the sheep. So this is a model about predation, okay? And uh, we basically put a lot of uh, sheep and uh, wolves in the same environment. So imagine like you you're in nature and you have like sheep and wolves. The sheep, they feed themselves from the grass. The wolves, they feed themselves from the the sheep. If there is no grass, the sheep will die. If there are no sheep, the wolves will die. That's basically like a, a chain of a, of a predation in here. Okay. And um, what happens is like if a wolf, like uh, in his movement, he meets a sheep, he eats the sheep. And um, the sheep, if they meet each other, they reproduce. And the grass has also regrowth time. So uh, after the sheep eats the grass, the grass is going to grow at a rate, let's uh, say. So wh when you simulate this kind of thing, like you can see that, like, uh, let me put it slower so you can uh, see what's happening here. So what's going on is basically that um, at the beginning of the simulation, we put the same number of sheep and the same number of wolves. So we have 100 sheep and 100 wolves. But because the movements are random, and because the beginning of the simulation is random, we never know who's gonna survive. So like in this simulation here, you can see that like the ships are dying because they have like a, a, a much bigger population of wolves and like they're gonna possibly die. And then the wolves start dying and the ships start multiplying themselves because the, the, the wolves didn't have food. And then suddenly you have just ships and they take over everything. And then they like, uh, the world's dominated by the by the sheep. You see that? If I run it again, it's not true that the, the sheep will always like survive. Like sometimes, like the wolves, they they survive and then they die because they don't eat grass. Like in this case here, the sheep they 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 basically uh, took over the world again. Like uh, if, if if in this case here, you see the wolves, they they 
they they they overtook and they killed all the sheep and then they died because there were no sheep to 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 eat anymore then the, in the end of the game the grass won like uh, we had the grass as the winner but notice that the variables at the beginning of the simulations are always the same but we never know the ending because it depends on many aspects. The grass won again because the sheep ate all the sh uh, the wolves ate all the sheep. Again, same thing. And then the sheep survived, and then the sheep overtook over the world. So, like, uh, and if you change the, the 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 variables, if you change like uh, uh, the gain that the sheep get from food, the the, the reproduction rate of the wolves, the reproduction rate of the sheep. Um, the, the grass regrowth, the number of the, the initial population, you can also define the, the, the ending result. Who are the agents in this model? The agents are the sheep and the wolves and the grass. They all have their own rules. The grass is at the same time, the, the grass at the same time that it's the agent, it's also the environment. So the grass is the environment with whom the sheep they basically interact with because if they find grass, they eat. If they don't find grass, they don't eat, and so on and so forth. So that's another uh, classic example of agent-based models used on uh, ecology, like say here. And uh, last but not least, I want to show you the, the the segregation model. And um, just to to take a look at my notes in here, let me just because uh, I need them for this one. Um, so we're in the wolves. So the, the, the segregation model was uh, created by uh, Schelling in uh, 1978. And uh, his study was very interesting because he, he started, um, he, he got interested on understanding uh, how people define their, uh, how, how people make decisions about where to live. Okay, so uh, basically the, uh, the model uh, shows two types of agents in a neighborhood. So you have a neighborhood and uh, you have like the houses and uh, the houses that are beside each other, they are, they are, they are neighbors. So the, the orange agents and the blue agents, they get along with each other, but each agent wants to make sure that it lives near of people who, who are like same of their own. So if you have, let me just like, um, let me just give the setup here so you can uh, see it better. So the thing is, each orange agent, which orange house wants to live near to at least some other orange agents. And each blue agent wants to live near to other like uh, blue agents as well. And uh, the simulation basically shows how these individuals are uh, the, the, the preferences, they ripple through the, the neighborhood, uh, leading them to a large scale uh, pattern here. So what happens, and it's very interesting the simulation here, is that um, it's a social experiment basically. Um, and um, it's basically what we're living now, but in 78, like uh, I, I'm like, a, I'm a right wing guy. And I prefer that, I prefer if my neighbors are like a right wing guys. Uh, I'm a left wing guy. I prefer if my neighbors are left wing guys or like a, I'm a wealthy person and I would prefer if people who live around me are wealthy as well. And this kind of stuff. Uh, it's about segregation and it's about how people make decisions even if the decisions are made unconsciously. Like it doesn't mean that people are, uh, are keen or prone to segregate. It's just some biological mechanisms that our brains have and that make us make change in our lives based on, uh, on uh, the people surrounding us. It's like friendships. We usually tend to be friends with people who think alike. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, 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 the last elections are a very good example of how these things work because nowadays like it's becoming impossible for some people to be friends with other peoples because of the differences on their political thinking, for instance. And in this model here, basically we have like uh, the, 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 the squares are the, the people who are happy. So like uh, they have enough people living around them that they are the same of their own. And the axes are people who are not happy, okay? 
So the axis here, like uh, so the blue axis, you, you're going to notice that the blue axis, they possibly have a lot of orange around them and vice versa. Um, we have here the density of the city and the density is important because these people are going to want to move to another place. And uh, if you put 100%, you don't have places to move. So people need to have other houses to move throughout the simulation. And you have uh, kind of the, the, the threshold here of the similarity people want to have. So in this case here, for this simulation, it's 30%. So, OK, I'm happy if at least 30% of my neighbors, they think alike, OK? If it's less than 30%, I'm out. I'm out of here. These people are crazy. I don't want to live around them. That's basically how it goes. And uh, um, here we have basically the, the percentage of similar people. So now we have like 49% of similarity. We have uh, 433 people that are unhappy. And we have like 17% of unhappiness in this town here. OK? And then we, 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 we go, we can move like each time step. So every time step, you can see that people move out. People, the axes move. The squares, they, they just are happy, so they don't have a reason to move. But sometimes axes move to places where people are happy and then they are not happy anymore and they want to move on the next step. So that's how it goes. And then like uh, you go to a point where like uh, people don't have to move anymore because everyone is happy. Okay? And now here, like uh, you don't have access anymore in the simulation because everyone is happy. And the thing is, like what what's interesting here is that what you have is basically the ghettos. It's the segregation. You're gonna have neighborhoods of people who are the same, and other neighborhoods that think differently. What's the purpose of this kind of simulation? Well, if you want to study social inequality in any country, this is a very important model to understand because it might explain. Like uh, why, like uh, you have uh, uh, very wealthy neighborhoods surrounded by favelas, for instance. That's very interesting to understand, and that might be one explanation for that. Um, you might be interested on in understanding how the city will develop in the future, and uh, what will happen if you, if like the, the the mayorship or if the government invests a ton of money only in one part of the city. And that might affect people's decisions of where to move. And then you are going to have like a very violent regions on your city. Uh, this can be used for elections purposes. You can study elections and uh, uh, how people affect each other and their political opinions as well. I mean, like what I mean is like there is an endless uh, number of applications you can have uh, with this uh, this kind of simulation. And then you can play with it. You can say like, oh, okay. So let's see, like, a, let's see a very big, uh, xenoph xenophobic, uh, racist society. Let's say let let's people let's say that people want at least eighty percent of the people thinking or of the same type. What would happen? Would have like a, a the, the 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 opposite of Disneyland. Would have like the the a hell land, because like everyone would be unhappy and no one would ever find a place to live. That's what happens in society when like uh, people become like too polarized or too like uh, biased or like a too uh, I forgot the, the the expression in English for that, but it's like you got my point here, okay? And uh, what if people are like okay, people accept the differences, people 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 like the differences actually, and they they don't they don't bother like uh, having to change. Let's put ten percent. So then you have like a you have a happy society. Where you have the difference living and like living together and like not, not having problems. So, uh, besides being a social experiment, it's a very good uh, philosophical uh, uh, way of uh, seeing these models and thinking about like how society would be if this would happen or that would happen, and so on and so forth. So, guys, uh, agent based models is fun, it's interesting. It basically will, um, uh, let's say, like it, it will be instigate your your brains. It will make you think about a lot of stuff. And uh, I'm basically showing these models because uh, you're gonna start having ideas as well. So write down your ideas. Think about what do you want to study and what do you want to simulate, because like uh, by the end of the course, I believe we can have very very cool projects. Uh, to share with each other and have like a very fun time.
just like uh, building the models and like, oh, this is interesting. Like if we, if we do this or that, that, that would happen. Um, I want to show you some of my models, okay? So uh, this is a study that I did in 2015 with students uh, from the same class. So that's basically the social network of these students. The thickness of the edges defines uh, how close they are. So if the, the, the edge is thicker, it means that they are better friends. Uh, and if the, 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 the edge is like a thinner of the edge doesn't exist, it means that they're just acquaintance or like they don't even know each other. Um, the, the color of the edges basically define how active, how physically active these people are. And the study was basically to define, like uh, if, if you have a lazy friend and you go to the gym every day, are you gonna become lazier or not? That's basically the question of this paper. And they've shown that our model, like uh, using agent-based models and uh, using some equations, we could predict if people are gonna get like a, uh, less active or more active based on the, the friendships they have. It's a very interesting paper. We, we're gonna talk about it throughout the, the, the semester and you're gonna have the chance to, to dive into it. But I just wanna show you like uh, how it works. This is another uh, work from 2018 with children. Uh, so we basically collected data from the kids in, uh, in the Netherlands from uh, more than a hundred schools. And uh, we asked the kids, who, who is the coolest, like, uh, colleague you have, who is the, the guy who, be, who, who dresses like a more fashionable, in a fashionable way, who is the one who eats the best, and we wanted to know uh, how much these kids interact with each other and uh, their eating behaviors, if it's healthy or not, if they do physical activity or not, to choose some kids in the network to apply some interventions in such a way that we, we basically, we teach some kids about healthy behaviors and they spread the behaviors to the whole class. So that was the basically idea of the, the model and we simulated these things. I've worked with COVID as well, a very depressive work, uh, but like uh, we, we did some uh, papers on uh, how COVID spreads in inequality uh, contexts. So we, we've done a simulation in uh, Copacabana, Ipanema and the Complexo do Pavão Pavãozinho, it's a huge favela behind these two neighborhoods. So that was like an experiment uh, of what, how, how the virus spreads and uh, how, how many people die and get sick uh, in a context of a very dense and high inequality. So we, we fed the, the model with like uh, statistics from demographic statistics. So we know that in the favelas, you have houses with like eight, nine, 10 people living in the same house with just a few rooms. While in Ipanema, Ipanema in Copacabana, you have very wealthy people living like in apartments and most two people, three people. But in the, in the other way around, like uh, the, the, age, the average age of people in Ipanema and Copacabana, the wealthier neighborhoods, they, it's, it's a higher age uh, average while in the favelas people are younger and the, comorbidities and stuff. So we basically did the simulation to see what happens. And that's a very nice paper we got. Um, we might talk about it throughout the semester as well. And if you wanna work with COVID on your main project, you're very welcome. Uh, I have many ideas on schools, schools coming back, what would happen um, and other topics related to COVID vaccination coverage, like uh, how is the vaccination coverage going on and uh, all kinds of stuff. And uh, as we are still in the middle of the pandemic and we have no idea when we're gonna get out of the shit, um, we, we have a lot of work to do on agent-based models for this kind of stuff in the following months, at least. All right. So that's it for today. I think Pedro had a question here, like about the fire simulation. The only way to put out the fire is where there are no trees in contact with it. Yes, on that simulation, the fire would just go like go off if it reach a point in the forest where it can't spread anymore because there are no trees around that area. Um, but you could like take this model, for instance, and adapt it. You could like uh, you could start creating. Uh, what if scenarios, like uh, what if the fire brigade, what if the firemen come 
and um, put some uh, blockage on this area here. That could be also. We could start studying like uh, how how to put off the fire without like uh, just like cheering for the the fire to spread on the right way so it doesn't go further. Okay. Any more questions, guys? And uh, if you wanna ask anything, just feel free. Not the time. Yep. Well, Pedro is typing. <laughs> Okay, net log is enough to make a paper like the COVID one. Um, regarding the complexity, it is. It's more than enough. You can create the agents with, with as many attributes you want. You can create as many rules you want. The, the bottleneck of models are the number of agents you have. That's the problem. If you want to simulate 100,000 people, of course, you, you need computational power. It's not just uh, net log, but, but then as uh, it's not net logo alone, like any language you use to simulate the model, if you have too many agents, like uh, having too many interactions with each other, uh, this thing escalates like really quick. And then like uh, you're going to need like a lot of memory, a lot of computational power, and you're going to need like uh, strategies to do so. Uh, so what's normally done is uh, you build smaller models you build like prototypes uh, starting them very small and then you you, you let them grow you, you start adding stuff and adding agents so you can see the limit <laughs> because what's true also is that um it's not necessarily required that you need to build the model for hundred thousand people sometimes the same thing you're going to observe for hundred thousand people you observe for a thousand so sometimes when you simulate with a thousand people and you add like a 10,000 more and you run the simulation, the graphics are going to be the same. The results are going to be the same. So why bother like uh, making a model like with 1 million people if you, you're going to have always the same results. So you have always, always when we do agent based models, we are always like uh, having to balance these things out. It's, um, it's, um, um, an equilibrium you have to find between like uh, how many agents, how complex is the model. But like uh, NetLog is made for complexity. You're gonna see it's amazing, it's amazing. You can do like a lot of stuff. Nice. No, don't worry, Pedro. And uh, don't, 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 uh, don't feel afraid of asking questions and making English mistakes. I'm gonna make a lot of English mistakes. I'm not British or American. English is not my first language, and we are here all to learn. So, just just feel free to to type or say whatever you want. Okay. So I'm gonna finish the lesson now. I'm gonna stop recording here.